morning, Church One. I'm an unabashed Lamar Jackson fan. Uh, I love the way he plays, and beyond that, I love the character he displays on the field. One of the things I really appreciate about him is his humility and his, his enthusiastic humility. Uh, you see this particularly when he throws an interception. Uh, after he throws the interception, very often the camera will pan back to him and you'll see him pounding his head and grabbing his helmet and thinking, why did I do that? How did that happen? And, and I'm sure very often if you asked him what happened, why did you throw that interception, he'd tell you, I just didn't see the defender. In the speed of the game and all that kind of stuff, it's probably easy to, to not see things that end up really tripping you up. That's particularly true of things that sort of are opposed to you, against you, uh, wanting to see you not do well, like a defense on a football team. In the same way, in our spiritual lives, it's probably good to realize that there are oppositional forces coming against us. And these oppositional, oppositional forces, uh, very often moving at the speed of life, are difficult for us to see. One of those things is sin. We rarely expect to see sin. Think about, you know, plans you make. Things about, think about, you know, your expectations for something exciting or even what you think's gonna happen the rest of today. I bet you in your expectations, you don't ever count in seeing sin or very rarely do you. But yet, you know experientially, it's gonna arrive and it's gonna show up somehow in the course of the day but it always seems to show up in an unexpected way. We very often don't see sin, particularly when you see um, sin as a, a God-centered thing. You know, one of the realities of sin is that sin is not just moral behaviors, but it is a drifting from God. And very rarely do we ever expect that we will just drift from God. We don't see it or expect it, but then somehow we find it happening. There's a, there's a force out there called sin that wants to disrupt us and pull us from God, and this is sin. Well, so what, you know? So what if I drift a little from God? What's the big deal, you know? Um, it, it still seems to be a distant problem. And that is the question, is it, isn't it? Is, is sin a big deal? Um, part of the hiddenness of sin is, is the unseen things that it does. Sin causes us to drift from God. And in so doing, other things happen. Things you weren't expecting, things that are, are unexpected turns in life. In today's passage, the Apostle Paul sees sin and its manifestations. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17, Paul writes this. He says, I'm grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I receive mercy so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his utmost patience, making me an, ex making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. In this passage, Paul is writing to his young protege, Timothy, and he's reflecting back on his life. And he's looking back and he's seeing the presence of sin in ways that he wouldn't have seen it in the moment. Paul's perception on sin and its manifestations is that it was always there, but very difficult to see in the moment. And that's true um, for us as well. You know, we often don't see the presence of sin even though it's there. One of the great uh, humbling things that you can do to yourself is just stop now and picture yourself seven years ago. 
picture of what was important, maybe some of the things that you were really caught up in, and odds are you'll find it a pretty humiliating experience. Some of the things that seem to matter so much or were so important or you're so tied up in change, and you look back at who you were and you realize how limited often your vision was or how, how unable to cope with really what you should have been coping with all along happened. The seven-year test can be a humbling thing. Very often we don't see the presence of sin unless we look back, because when we're in the midst of it, it's often hidden. That became clear to me in a lot of ways uh, with the pandemic. As we move 18 months into this thing, I reflect back on those early months, and it's, it's interesting, I read an article that some people are actually, uh, some. TikToks and stuff like that are showing up and sort of getting nostalgic about the early days of the pandemic. And man, I don't get nostalgic at all. Like I look back at that time and I look back at how much I struggled. And I wish I could tell you my struggle was out of, um, you know, a healthy fear of a virus or, uh, you know, that the suffering that people were, ta were taking on. But my struggles were much more worldly. I did not like my routines being upset. I did not like things getting in the way of the way I wanted to live my life. The, the pandemic like revealed in me like what a worldly heart I have. And I don't think I would have seen it. I still struggle to see it. But when I look back, I can, I can recognize it. So sin is like that, right? Sin is... Um, it's hidden. Well, what are we to do about it? What do, how are we to, you know, like ex battle our sins? You know, Paul does something really important here when it comes to sin. He names it. He renounces it. He owns it. If you look in verse 13, verse 13, he says, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence, he names specifically the things that he was doing, and he owns them, and he renounces them. I mean, he says, like, later on, he says, I was the foremost of sinners. I was the chief of sinners. Like, he, he doesn't hold back in, in renouncing and owning his sin. And that's, that's an important part of dealing with sin is naming it and owning it. But then how do we name and own it when it's so difficult to see? Do we get obsessive about it? Do we try to look for sin in everything we do? Do we search out our motives till we're sure that we can have the purest of motives and somehow be free of sin? I don't think that's the answer. I don't think the answer is trying to see it all. I opened this, uh, this little talk with Lamar Jackson and the unseen difficulties of throwing an interception well, the same year that Lamar Jackson uh, was drafted as a quarterback in 2018, Lamar Jackson was drafted with the 32nd pick. Uh, they, uh, Sam Darnold was drafted, I think it was with the second pick with the New York Jets, maybe a little bit later, but very early on, Sam Darnold was drafted as a quarterback, just like Lamar Jackson. But Sam Darnold's career struggled. He struggled in his early beginnings. In fact, there's a famous clip of him on a Monday night football game where he was mic'd up, um, and he said on the sidelines, they were playing, the, the Jets were playing the New England Patriots. And he said on the sidelines to his teammates after kind of uh, taking a few sacks and throwing a few interceptions, he said, I'm seeing ghosts out there. And, and what he meant by that is he was seeing defenders that weren't really there. In, 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 the, in the speed of the game and all the opposition he was in, encountering, he was actually seeing more than was there. You know, you, you can do that when it comes to sin. If you obsess over things and, 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 and try to find it everywhere, you end up seeing ghosts. See, the way out of sin is, is not to, you know, ignore it and act like it doesn't exist and pretend not to see it, and it's not to see ghosts. The, the real way out of sin is to see something else. And that's exactly what Paul is modeling here in this passage. What Paul wants the readers to see is not his sin, but ultimately he wants them to see what God is doing. Look what he says again 
it says that God appointed Paul to his service. He, he says, even though Paul did all these things, what does he say? He received mercy. And later on in verse 14, the grace of our Lord overflowed in faith and love. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. For that reason, he says again, I received mercy so that Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience. And he says to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. Really what Paul is asking the readers to see is to see their, his sin in the context of the mercy of God. There's something powerful and profound about that. Well, there's something amazing about being able to see what God is doing and his mercy and to look at the heart of God. Because when you see that, you are able to see your sin, Paul says. It's seeing the heart of God and the action of God first that enables you to see what you need to see. That's what Paul's saying. Paul, God, what Paul saw ultimately was the merciful heart of God. And when he was able to see the merciful heart of God, he had a better view of his sin. How does that work? How is it that when we really uh, see God for who he is, we're in a better position to see us and the problem of sin? I came across a quote this week from C.S. Lewis and it says this, it's from the book Mere Christianity. He says, remember that, as I said, the right direction leads not only to peace, but to knowledge. When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. A moderately bad man knows he's not very good. A thoroughly bad man thinks he's all right. This is common sense, really. You understand sleep when you are awake, not while you're sleeping. You can see mistakes in, the, in math when your mind is working properly. While you're making them, you cannot see them. You can understand the nature of drunkenness when you are sober, not when you are drunk. Good people know about both good and evil. Bad people do not know about either. See, what Paul's saying, what C.S. Lewis is saying is that seeing the heart of God enables us to see the thing we need to see, which is our sin. Just like Lamar Jackson needs to see that defender before he throws that ball. In the same way, we need to see the force of sin, the very thing that's difficult for us to see. And the way that we are best able to see our sins is to see the heart of God, which brings us to communion. Because communion is the only thing that I know that together enables us to see not only the heart of God, but our sin as well. So before we head to the table, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for these elements. May these elements enable us to see your heart, your incredible mercy. And in seeing that, Lord, may they enable us to see ourselves clearly as well. Communion gives us the eyes to see. When Jesus was walking post-resurrection with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize who Jesus was. It was only when he broke the bread and shared the cup that their eyes were opened. And Jesus instituted communion with his followers to be a reminder of two important things, two things that we need to see, the mercy of God and the depth of our sin. Because on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Jesus died as an act of mercy for our sins. Paul said he was the foremost of sinners, but we're all sinners. We all wander from God. We all turn astray. And there's a cost for sin. Jesus Christ, Paul said, came into the world to save sinners. And the way he saved sinners and the way he continues to save sinners is through his death. When we take this bread, we recognize that it was his body broken for us that saves us. See in this bread the mercy of God. Take and eat.
One of the hardest things about encountering your brokenness, your frailty, your sin, about facing up to the ways that we all wander away from God, is that it's easy for us to believe the lie that God will leave us because of our failures. Jesus did not want us to feel that way. In fact, he took the cup on the night he was betrayed and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. A covenant is a promise, it's an agreement, it's an arrangement. And the arrangement is simply this. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, he promises never to leave us or forsake us. And because of that enduring promise, we have the spiritual strength to admit our sins, to recognize where we fall short and not fear the rejection of God because God has purchased our acceptance through his blood. And so when you take this cup and you drink it, you are entering into this new covenant. So as you drink this cup, drink in the mercy of God and let it give you the eyes to see the heart of God and your own heart. Take and drink. These are simple elements but they're also vessels by which we see the heart of God. The broken cup, the broken bread, the cup of his blood are all signs and symbols to us of his enduring mercy for us. And because of that great mercy, we can see things we might not want to see. Church One, as you leave this week, may God grant you the eyes to see his mercy and love in such a way that you can see yourself and the brokenness of this world with the clarity we all need to experience healing and wholeness. God bless you. Have a great week.